How are you all doing? Good? So, you really are a glutton for punishment, right? World Cup, everything on your TV, all about football, and now you're going to sit through 20 minutes about a football club. Okay, so a little bit about um, who I am in Arsenal Media Group. So, I work for Arsenal Media. We are uh, an agency that works within Arsenal Football Club. We are actually a joint venture. We're 50% owned by Arsenal Football Club and then 50% owned by uh, Cronky Sports Entertainment. Cronky Sports Entertainment is owned by a guy called Stan Cronky, who also owns 70% of the football club. So it sounds a little bit confusing. I was trying to think about how I explain this to you on the train this morning. I guess we're a bit like Vatican City. In that, you know, Vatican City sits within Rome but they kind of have their own autonomy, and that's very much like our media agency in that. We don't report into a communication team. We don't report into a marketing team. Uh, we're a standalone business of, of roughly around sort of five million pounds that own the media rights uh, for the club. We're a staff of about 38. I'd say, yeah, the vast majority are editorial. These are your journalists, editors, et cetera, et cetera. And then you've got the rest of us that are kind of sort of trying to keep the lights on and trying to make sure that we can get this content out on time. Um, this is really what we do. We're there to serve the club in driving fan engagement. So that's our first step, is try and get, try and grow that global fan base. We, and then on, one step up from that is then to try and see how we can sort of uh, improve on that communication to try and make these guys digital, digital members, so a free digital member, or then take them through to being a paid digital member. And then we're also there, once we've got this fan base, uh, it's quite attractive to partners and sponsors we're there to help them deliver a kind of engaging experience to that audience, either through Facebook or the other digital channels that we own. So how do we do that? Well, it's interesting. I think it's like I've, I've explained this before to, to other people about the football club. We are limited in the rights we, we've got to show. The, the Premier League, which is owned by B Sky B and BT Sport, predominantly that's, that's what people want to watch. Well, I don't have the rights to that. We can't show that as a live game. So we're also, we can't show advertising outside of our own sponsors because they get upset. So for example, one of our sponsors is Emirates. We are unable to show BA or any of those others. But what we can do is we do have a really good relationship with the players behind the scenes. So we get exclusive access uh, to you know, the, the, the head coach. We get exclusive access to players. We're on the training ground. We've got, obviously got uh, extensive uh, relationships with ex-Arsenal players as well. And then what you also find is that we are that official voice. So you, there's a lot of clickbait out there around assigning players, signing managers, etc. And you'll see that across all these other sort of sports channels, particularly in the UK, where we're probably over-serviced by the amount of uh, people that are putting out sports news. But what you will find is that no one will believe what they say until they've actually read it on Arsenal.com. So we see these huge spikes where you'll see the news going out there. And as soon as we hit the button so, and put the release out there, our, site, our, our website numbers sort of go out through the window. And then um, also, we, also what you'll see is normally on a Thursday, we call it team news, but really it's about player injury, so people want to know who's fit for the game that are playing that weekend. And then obviously what we, are, we, we also like to do is provide a, an Arsenal-centric view on uh, match day coverage. So this uh, normally we've got three um, sort of productions that we produce, which I'll go into a little bit more detail on the, on the next slide. So we have what originally started off with just uh, online. So this was the club's official website uh, channel. Just won a Webby Award, so it's not too bad. Uh, we also uh, produced this three-hour media block, which some people won't realise what we do. So although we can't show the content live for a lot of the games because of the media rights, we do actually have the rights then to be able to sell that content beyond the UK, and we're able to play that content after a certain embargo time. That embargo is normally, if we're playing on a Saturday at 3 o'clock, we're normally allowed to play that content back out at midnight. And we've got 26 broadcasters around the world that we deliver uh, 45 minutes, so first half, second half. We produce an in-house documentary every week. We do a kind of match of the day, it's kind of a match analysis. Uh, and now also we do the press conferences, and that's all played out, normally from midnight. Uh, it goes from here to BT Tower, um, up to two satellites, one for the Northern Hemisphere, one for the Southern Hemisphere. And in the area that's, uh, it's, it's, this is a bit of a poison chalice actually. So this is our biggest growing area. With the fan base and it, the numbers are just continue to increase around social. Particularly now all these social channels are turning to video, which is great. The problem is how do you then 
engage with those fans in a way that actually is more meaningful to your own business, because who owns that fan? So trying to get, and especially with things like GDPR, it's very hard to try and work out how we're actually to monetize this area. Um, but that said, if you want to get your, you know, get your brand out there, or in our case, you know, to, to engage with that audience, th this is amazing. And I've got a little um, video. This video is quite old, actually, but just to show you some of the numbers. So we talk, you've, I don't know if people talked about the quality of video and the production values you put in. Some of these videos is just like a five second clip that was stuck out there, but let's have a look and see. So a little bit more about um, the type of content we produce and how much we produce. We roughly grow, I don't know how this translates to people and I don't know how much, but we're roughly about five terabytes a month. I was trying to work out another way of trying to, um, my, trying to explain to my boss actually about the amount of content. So if you took every James Bond movie and had it as Blu-ray, I think it's something like 21, 23, we're producing that same amount of uh, video per week, every week. So we were growing, um, our storage is, we're always trying to, f to get this content um, onto our servers and then we're trying to normally archive out the back of it. But the vast majority of what we produce is sort of match day content, so this is what we're taking. We're entitled to a host feed. For every game that Arsenal play, we're entitled to bring back that host feed where we put our own match day commentary and uh, graphics across it. We also do features, so these are things that are normally planned, normally a, a couple of weeks or sometimes a couple of months in, in, in advance. And these are uh, interviews with the players, backstories, etc. And then we have this thing called Club Day. So Club Day is a specific day each month that the players have to arrive at the training ground. And they, this is where we have likes of Sky, Sport, and everyone's got an allocation amount of time they have with certain players. And then the rest you'll, you'll sort of see around is just interviews, training, signings. We do a little bit of analysis and uh, episodic content. So this is where we do our sort of documentaries, etc. So a little bit of my background. Uh, so I joined the club about four years ago. It's gone really quick. Um, I joined under when I first walked around and looked at the infrastructure. There was no real significant infrastructure uh, investment in about five years. And um, as I got around to meet people, there's definitely certain individuals that were key to, to Arsenal functioning. And if they'd gone, they, there's certainly going to be challenges ahead. And I sort of walked around and I said, right, let's just walk me around with everything that we've got. And then straight away, there, there, you could see there was a clear need for some changes. So our edit hardware was starting to age. It was starting to go end of life. With the same, with, with using Final Cut Pro. Final Cut Pro was loved by all the editors. They really didn't want to move away from it. It's, yeah, it's what they'd grown up on. We had a kind of archive system, which they called a MAM, but they never used it. You had to, we had this weird scenario where they wouldn't archive anything until the end of the season where you'll start to run out of storage. And then they would say to them, guys, you've really got to tidy up, right, we're running out of space. So they would just grab all the content, tag it as football, and just stick it into the archive. And then they would have trouble then trying to get it back. So it wasn't particularly useful. And we're also, like I said, the, the amount of content these guys were producing was starting to run out of storage. And the other thing we're starting to find with the storage was that as we were growing as a team and we're starting to take on more editors, we were starting to hit the limits of bandwidth just reading off the disk. So video was starting to stutter, particularly on match days. Um, and the, the storage we had was fairly expensive. So I was trying to find a way that how do I do this investment while also trying to um, not look like I'm going off and spending all my boss's money. And this was the kind of challenge that we sort of faced. So, and the real bugbear, and this was just crazy, was just, they were storing content everywhere. It was on hard disks on people's desks. They were in cupboards. They were storing it on the scratch drives that were sitting underneath their table. They, the way they,
catalogued it was they had a folder structure but it wasn't particularly organized well so what you find is you'll go in and say wait Dave you know that piece of content we shot yesterday do you know where it is and went no 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 Johnny shot that where's Johnny oh he's off on holiday oh we're gonna have to give him a call give Johnny a call so give Johnny Johnny where did you store that oh I think it was in that folder no it's not there oh it must be in the next folder so it was just crazy um, and the one thing you started to find when we were starting to do that was it's starting to limit the, how quickly we turn this content around. And if I look at where the team is now to um, where they were, I mean, there's no way we could get the content out. There's just no way we'd be able to meet those sort of demands. So we had no access control. People could come in, delete, remove, do whatever they want to do it, rename it. Um, there was no metadata search, so actually you were just relying on the base OS to try and find this stuff. And some of these folders, when you opened them up, it was just tons, and so it'd take a while just for it to catalogue all the videos that were in there. So, yeah, it was, it was challenging. And as I said to them, they didn't know half the stuff they had because it was just hidden in folders. So I was new to the club. No reason to be trusted. Uh, the guys tagged me as keen of keyboards because they said I was IT. And, you know, they had this culture of, well, we're OK. We've been doing this for five years. It's fine. Um, and my boss was saying, look, I'm not going to give you a load of money to invest in this. So you're going to have to find a way of making this work. And by the way, we're really football, busy, busy football season. So at the moment, like I said, most, some of the club are kind of taking time off because the World Cup's on. There's not a lot of them to do. All my team are really busy upgrading all the bits that we couldn't upgrade during the, during the season. So I sat down. We had a walk around with uh, some of the team. We're not a large, from an actual engineering perspective, there's only three of us. And I thought about how we were going to approach this. And what I wanted to do was any kind of investment we're going to do now, I wanted to make sure that it wouldn't just suffice now, but it would last going forward. So we had this idea of just coming up with a city plan. I think it's always worthwhile having a city plan. It, you may not, you can have a vision of where you want to go. You may take a different path as you go through it because things happen, but you need that, that end vision. And we also went through a process of what I call sort of traffic lights. So it was like, okay, well, let's have a look. What's on fire? What needs to be changed now? What can be changed next season? What can be changed the season after that? And then what I did was I didn't want to tell my boss the full city plan. So if you imagine, he's like looking after a shed. And if I went to him and saying, oh, by the way, I'm going to build you this hotel, he's just going to freak and go, how much? So I kind of told him a little bit of the story, uh, which he felt comfortable with. And also when I started to talk to... Uh, editors, I didn't really want to confuse them by, by the way, I'm going to build this amazing elaborate system. I just told them the little bit that, and I told them the bit that would actually uh, make most difference to them. But in the back of my mind, and certainly the, the, the engineers, we had this idea that we were going to lead on to bigger and greater things. The next thing I realised is that when we started talking to these editors, we didn't really use the same sort of um, we didn't have the same sort of dialect. We didn't speak the same. So certainly there were certain individuals that just didn't want to listen. They were quite happy, didn't want to change. So, but we did find a couple of our editors that kind of got it. They said, we can't operate like this. It is stupid. We want to, we want to change. So they're the ones that we sort of formed a relationship with. And then we got them to tell our story. And that kind of worked quite well. So we didn't have to um, convince those guys that are most against you know, that change. Um, and what we also did was we found that, like I said, just trying to, there was a lot of change that had to happen. And so we just tried to keep it simple. So even when we were starting to do the changes in the infrastructure, we'd do them in small stages. And we tried to, you know, the tainted with sugars, just we tried to do the quick wins. How do we build that level of trust? I just rehomed dot com. When I started with dot com, it was, it was on bits of tin, et cetera, et cetera. And then we moved it into the cloud. So I'd already got that level of trust with my boss. But with all the editors, they didn't know me from Adam. So there's some quick wins that we kind of had. So we said, right, we're just getting some new hardware. We'll upgrade there um, and get them onto some new software. So they like that, right? So they got new toys to play with, and they got to go on training courses for Adobe, et cetera, et cetera. So that was great. The bit that we knew we were going to have trouble with is, is really how do we take this amount of storage? We had about 400 terabytes sitting on some storage that we need to move on to new storage. And to, to migrate it, we needed to stick it through an asset management system. And it was stored everywhere, the names weren't right, and it was just going to be an absolute headache. Um, and that was the bit that was going to, that was the bit that I kind of was losing sleep over when I was going through this sort of process. Um, so, and when I sat down with the editors, I started to understand where they were. So the, the real issue of why the, 
why this content was sitting everywhere is they were work they literally jobs were coming in they would do the job export it out it would go they would start the next job and they just didn't have the time to log the content you speak to any editor they don't like logging and we didn't have the resources to go and hire someone in to come in and start editing content so we need to find a way that they would work with them so we found a particular asset management system and the, and the first thing I liked it was first firstly it doesn't matter where it's stored. They don't even need to know where it's stored. And I like the way that actually we were able to just get them to ask them a few basic questions at the beginning, right? Just like, why are you producing this content? What season is it? Is it episodic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we had a lot of drop down lists of just, they didn't have to type, there wasn't a lot of free text. And what we found with that is it just started to improve the discipline around what they were doing and it started to give us a bit more consistency in what we're doing. And they didn't think they were logging, so they would, fill out this little template, drop it in, say create, and that would even fire up Adobe for them. We didn't even have to go to Adobe and then say, right, open project, save it to this area. What we also found is as, as we started to do this, we, then obviously we, st we were looking at how do we, show me how you're editing. So what we find sometimes is they would go into Adobe Premiere and they would create maybe a sequence name and they would say Ozil's five, top five kicks or whatever, and they were doing that within Premiere itself. So we worked with this particular company to, to be able to extract that data out of the sequence names and pull it back into the asset management system. So again, the editors were doing what they normally do, the normal workflows, tagging the sequence names, et cetera, et cetera, sticking in markers and stuff so they knew where they were. And we, all we were doing was just sucking it out behind the scenes and sticking it into for what they're doing. Um, so that worked pretty well. And then what we started finding is obviously because we were starting to get all that metadata and we're still trying to improve that, we're able actually to turn around content. And I sat down with the editors just last week when I was saying I was doing this presentation and I was asking them, you know, look, how have you found it? How's it going, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and one of the things one of the editors was just saying, was saying we're, we're, we're now finding content we didn't know we had. So they had done a particular feature, he was looking for a particular thing on the player, he stuck it in and he found this piece of content, he's going, oh Christ, I didn't know we had that. Put it in. Um, so th that's what we're kind of like. And what we also got now is we have a lot of freelancers coming in because we're producing so much content. And no longer do they have to go and ask someone where content's stored. They can sort of come in here, type it, and they'll find it. So that's, it's, it's working quite well. But we still had to do that sort of migration and uh, it was tough. So there's still amount of manual labor for when we went from sort of this chaotic place where we were storing all our content. Um, and what we really had to do was, it, and it, we were having to do it through a season, so we had literally about, I think we had about six weeks to lift and shift this content and try and organise it in a way that these guys could use. So we prioritised matches, so we looked at doing the first last two seasons because that was most relevant, and in doing key matches that we'd done. We still had to do things like visual file inspection because when guys just stuck a footy on a file name, we had to actually work out what that footy was. So a lot of the content we actually had to go and watch um, we had to cross deck names and dates because sometimes people put year, year uh, as the first one or got the date wrong or that kind of stuff. So we spent a lot of time renaming folders. And we still had to do the, and control that manual copying because we were moving from one storage system into another storage system. And it was very easy just to blow out that bandwidth where you're doing so much copying of that data across that the guys couldn't actually use the, um, couldn't actually edit. We also work quite hard on a naming structure, which is, uh, I would say, is key to anyone that's going into this asset management. So we're trying to work out, in our case, it was trying to work out, they, when we originally picked the content up, they went by uh, episodic content. So if it was a, what, like an Arsenal documentary called Arsenal World, they went Arsenal World, and then they went season, you know, 2012, 2013, 2014. But actually, for when we go about um, finding this content, certainly when we look about archiving, we switched it around. Uh, so we had to work with the guys on that. And we tried to do where we could to try and avoid as much free text as we could. Because the more free text you put in, the more spelling mistakes you get, the more manual error you get, and the harder it is to find. And then what we tried to do is to speed everything up. This is where we started to look at how we do the automation. So actually by creating this nice folder structure and working with the editorial team to drop these stuff into, folders, into the folders, the uh, asset management system we used could actually read the folder structure in all the paths and then use that for search keywords. So for example, if it was uh, an interview with Ozil and it was sitting in a 2017 folder, Premier League, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you could search for uh, Premier League because it was a folder name or you search for Ozil. 
so that quite, worked quite well. It was, and it was generating proxies as it was going in, and we had a number of uh, automated sort of archive scripts, because one of the things we were having is, as we were moving the stuff in, we were starting to run out of storage, so we then having to move it off into archive in the, in the background. So it's just some sort of key learnings, I guess, what, what we found when we were going through this was, it's, it's really hard to do this alone. When you're working with these teams, you have to, you have to get them on side. You won't get everyone on side. So try and find those individuals that seem to be warm to you and, and, and receptive to the ideas you're trying to put in. Um, take your time. We spent uh, a good few weeks uh, trying to work out the best way to uh, use our asset management system. We tried it one way, didn't feel right. We tried another way, sat down with the editors, had to listen with them. Because uh, we knew once we started on that journey of moving 400 terabytes of data across, it was going to be really hard to, to reorganise it if we felt that we, we hadn't done it in the right way. Behaviours don't change overnight. So this is interesting. So we put in this amazing uh, asset management system where they can do all these keyword searches. And I was speaking to the guys yesterday, and some of them are, st are not using it. They're still going back to finding a folder as in, uh, within the uh, sort of as a management system and drilling down through menus because that's what they're comfortable with. So which is fine, they're still able to find the content, but it's, it's interesting how that it takes a while for people to adapt. Uh, we, to the, some of the guys that didn't believe in what we're doing, we then st we went to set them some examples. We said, okay, well, you do it your way, we'll do it our way, we're not editors, and I bet you I can find that content quicker than you. And we did, went through a couple of exercises with them, and that worked quite well, just to prove our point. And I think the one thing we're finding through um, everything that we're doing is just this changing in working practices, just, just buying some new hardware and helping these guys get the asset managed. We're finding that actually it's starting to prove the quality and the professionalism of how we work. And what it actually really did was it just kicked a whole transformation exercise on where we're now uh, and just transformed this area. This, we actually did this about a year and a half two years ago, but we're now there's other parts of the structure that we're, we continue to, to transform. And every season, everyone's saying, right, what are we going to do this season? So it really changed all the attitudes. But, so yeah, thank you.